Well, the major thing that happens with a spinal cord injury is a metamorphosis. You change. There's no choice. You're not the person that could do all the things that you could do before. And when you're in a hospital, there's a bubble of hope. There's a bubble of possibilities that, that you'll walk again, that you'll rehabilitate yourself. And you also are surrounded by people whose common goal it is to get you as better as possible, as quickly as possible. And then when you leave that environment and you go back to the world, well, the bubble bursts. It pops because now you're in the world alone. How do I redefine myself? And then it becomes this scramble of, you know, just clawing for <laughs> who were you? How can you maintain as much of that as possible? And then who am I now and what do I want to become? Yeah, just the rehab, just to be able to pick up things with your hands that aren't working and figuring how to hold you know, cups and eat and with forks and, and then just all these little weight training stuff and standing frames and it's just equipment after equipment, you know, and it's overwhelming. Whether you're paralyzed or able-bodied, to actually do physical therapy all the time is a full-time job. And a lot of people, they do it for months and months and months because they're like, you know, pumped up about it. But at some certain time, you take a day off, turns into like a week off, turns into a month off. So that's the difficult thing because when you don't work out in a situation like myself, then you lose everything that you worked out for. You know, you get this atrophy, you know, you build up the muscles in your legs and then you don't work out for a month or two and then you lost whatever you did and that's discouraging. And I think that's what sucks a lot about this injury is that you could work your ass off for months and months and years and years and lose it really fast. I think I was in the tough world of rehabilitation and that was a brutal reality because I was, they were having me do a lot of things to work in the wheelchair, like get my upper body strength stronger. And I was like, no, I just want to walk. I only want to be doing therapy for my legs. I don't want to transfer. I don't want you to tell me in a wheelchair I had to go to the refrigerator and take out a dozen eggs. I was getting so frustrated by them. Like, we want to teach you how to, you know, diaper your baby at the wheelchair. Like, it was always the wheelchair level. Like, just the sound of that used to just, I would almost want to burst into tears. Mind you, I mean, I, I was a little hormonal. <laughs> I was still adjusting to just having a newborn. And, um, but normally my nature is, you know, nice. And I think I was nice to everybody there, but inside, you know, it was just a volcano. It was like ready to erupt. So, you know, the eggs out of the fridge and all the stuff that they were having me do was just furthering my, then I guess I was getting a little bit angry, but I was more, I don't know if I displayed it in that way. Um, at night, it was mostly like that I would just sob. I would just be sad. Expectations of being able to just get up and walk out of this thing. You know, I wanted to just breathe first. That's a step. Once I got off the ventilator, that was a huge milestone. Recognized that, that improvement, celebrated it. The next one was to be able to scratch an itch on my nose. That was huge. I was able to wiggle my toe. My sister had painted my toenails rainbow colors with her nail polish. And I used that as a visualization technique to connect my mind to the muscle. And when I flickered that left blue toe, that was a magical moment. And I just started to really break it down into those tiny incremental improvements, which were huge. And I stayed in that space. I stopped looking way far ahead, expecting more. I was just happy to be here, man. Yeah, I mean, I stacked those gains like Legos. You know, um, we wheeled into the rehab clinic motionless and I was able to stand in water with full bracing. I was able to 
you know, eliminate bracing. I was able to regulate blood pressure. I was able to give my dad a hug on Father's Day. You know, like we recognized all those tiny little improvements, all those things we're celebrating. And so when I left the hospital, I was fired up, ready to keep going, really motivated to, you know, work. I had uh, occupational therapy, I had physical therapy, I had recreational therapy. And I actually, after the first, I'd say, month, stopped going to occupational therapy and stopped going to recreational therapy because I didn't want to build ceramic bowls and I didn't want to bake cookies in my wheelchair. I wanted to play basketball again. So I put my nose to the grindstone and I did everything that I possibly could. And uh, there were multiple times where I had to do my homework and instead of that I was just so frustrated that I rolled out of my room in my wheelchair and I took my left leg out because after a month it started to get some movement and I just had my ankle movement. I remember just, pro uh, <clears throat> I remember just propelling myself with my left foot because I knew I knew that one thing would lead to the next. And I knew that even if I just had my left foot, I could do something. And that was still proving somebody wrong and that was still being the captain of my body. And just like I said earlier, you know, <clears throat> one arm propels another, one leg propels another, whether it's your own body or if it's somebody else. You know, it's, it's a challenge to just get up every day and having to get dressed, even just to get dressed can be a challenge or having to get up and, and cook for yourself. It's, it's all these little things that just do not even complete the big picture of what living with a spinal cord injury is like. Like, it's just, you can't even explain it because people just see the physical ability that you can't walk, but there's so many other things that um, it's just makes it so difficult to live, but you see, we still push through it. And I don't know, it's just, I, I, I asked myself, did you ever think that you would be feeling as good as you feel now? Um, no, there's a system at the hospital that they use from one to 10, from one to 10, how do you feel one being bad, um, 10 feeling great. And I remember for a long time, it was like one. <laughs> I can't say zero because I'm not like dead, but I'll give you a one because it was just, like I just couldn't imagine. I never thought that I would live being a, a paraplegic in a wheelchair and what my life would be like and, and having to feel or having to help other people feel comfortable with being around me. It's so strange that I had to learn how to be comfortable with myself so that somebody else around me can feel comfortable and not feel so weird around me or feel um, that they have to say something positive to me just to be around me or, I don't know, I just, I want to see, I want to feel normal, I want someone else to feel normal around me, I want someone else to see me as normal. I have this one woman, Nancy, who volunteered to help and um, so she would take me to and from physical therapy and. Um, but then like after a year or so after my accident, I really started to get my independence. I got like a car and I started driving and um, a bunch of things happened. Um, I ended up having a lawsuit. Um, that was cool, not really. Um, but I ended up buying a home. So now I have my own house and I'm like super, super independent now. And so needing all of this help was like really hard for me. It was a struggle. I was always like self-conscious and sad about it. So that's another reason like I didn't really go out a lot because I just didn't like that I had to have so much help. Um, that's hard for me. So that really was hard in the beginning. But thankfully now I've kind of learned and can do every pretty much everything on my own, which is cool. So, but it took a while to get there. It took about like a year before I even got a car and started driving. So that first year was really rough. So when I first went home, I lived with my sister and her fiance. Um, and it's crazy to look back on now because 
when they for, when I was first in the hospital and when I left the hospital, they didn't teach me anything that like like in the middle of the night they would always come and rotate me so I didn't get pressure sores. So I went home thinking that I still needed to do that. So I went home and my sister would literally wake up in the middle of the night to turn me on my different sides, which is insane because you don't need to do that. <laughs> or I, I can do that by myself now, but they didn't really teach me how to do that by myself. So I had someone turning me in the middle of the night. I had someone helping me with my bathroom program in the morning, which was also my sister. So, I mean, I had a lot of help within that first six or seven months coming out of rehab because um, I just didn't know that I could do these things by myself. And I think I hit a point finally when I was like, you know, like, I want to, okay, this is, I want to be able to do it myself, and I know that I can, so I'm going to do it.